Hi, I'm Richard, and I'm going to talk today about something that I don't know if uh, other Irish whistle tutorials have talked about much, and that's different approaches to uh, fingering. So there is, if you look at a fingering chart of an Irish whistle, it's going to say and so forth. And this this it's called open fingering system and that's the way that uh, the bone flute was designed. It was uh, very theoretical that whatever note you were playing, everything below should be open. <clears throat> and sorry, I have a cold. Uh, the thing is, is a lot of folk instruments don't work like that. Or don't have that tradition. Now they, you can, you can apply that uh, concept to folk instruments, but they don't. It's not necessarily indigenous to the folk instrument. <clears throat> For one thing, you have um, the issue comes up of, of what they call an anchor finger. So if you notice when I'm playing totally open, when I get to a certain point, like if I'm down here, D, E, F sharp, and G, you've got the whole upper hand on the whistle, so it doesn't have to be anchored. Once you get higher, once you get the upper hand notes, it starts getting a bit wobbly. And so uh, if you're doing an open system, it's the same like, and this is borrowed actually from the bone flute, is the bone flute, the little finger here, has a key that it depresses whenever you're playing other notes. And that keeps the, uh, but that key is holding a hole open, so you're still keeping the openness. Um, so, uh, so you're keeping there's an anchor finger on the bone flute, but yet it's keep it's maintaining the open philosophy. And since there's nothing down there, it does the same thing. So, so you got that anchor finger on there. Now, whether you put it on for it's not really necessary for. E or F sharp, whether you put it on for G or not, it's not really necessary. Once you get to the high notes, especially B and C sharp, you kind of need that anchor finger. Now there are players, and some very good players, who keep their little finger down the whole time. And they play really well. And to me, it's awkward though. To me, it's awkward playing E, and especially doing ornaments like a pat on E with that finger down. So if I was going to use an anchor finger like that, to me, I would play these without the anchor, and maybe even G, and then put the anchor on. <clears throat> now what you see, now that maintains the theoretical, the bohm, theoretical open fingering, which is, uh, you know, it, which is a nice goal to have, but not necessarily indigenous to traditional Irish whistle playing. What you'd see in the old days, and this violates the bone concept theory, but what you see very often, if you look at an illen pipes, illen pipes are not, and highland pipes, highland bag pipes, they're not based on an open fingering system. And they're not based on a closed fingering system. They're, they're based on what's called a partially open or partially closed fingering system. Or for uh, notes, so even if you're playing, say, this note with on a whistle or flute or like a bone system instrument, you want everything below open. On the Illin pipes and on the Scottish Highland pipes, these fingers are going to be closed for that. And there's a little bit of that if you see, and you, and you see a spectrum on the, on the whistle, but 
when I started playing, which was back in the 1970s, the players I was watching didn't play open. They didn't play with this kind of what I think of as like a bohm or classical approach to fingering the whistle. They did, I think, what I, my perception was it was a more traditional or folk approach. Now, whether it is or not, but to this day, you'll see a lot of whistle players some very good whistle players using, like uh, Mary Bergen, um, doing some of these things. <clears throat> and one of the things is using this finger, the lower hand ring finger, as an anchor. So when you're playing this, but once you get past that, like say to A, then this finger will come down, or often comes down. Almost always it's going to be off down here. G it could be on or, or off, but definitely these. <clears throat> you see that all the time with traditional players. And one thing on high whistle is that keeping that down doesn't impact the no, any of the, the high, upper hand notes. So. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt anything having that down. So that's why you'll see, I think, a lot of players uh, use that. <clears throat> now, what the problem is, is if you learn to play that way, which like I did, is when you pick up low whistle, low whistle, there's, for some reason, the acoustics work differently. And if you're in the low octave, you can keep that anchor finger down and you're fine. doesn't affect anything. But in the second octave, here's open. High B is is uh, harsh. You can you can see just holding high B and putting that finger down. It's 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 funky. So I had to kind of relearn playing. Um, and, and learn to keep high B open. So I'm in the second octave. I will switch to using my little finger as my anchor. <clears throat> but still, when I'm in the low octave, I'll, I'll kind of go back to my old habit of, of using that one. So, but you have to keep in mind that low whistles were just invented in the 1970s. So it's a recent uh, impact that, um, that has happened. Now, it dawned on me... Then I started, I, when I observed whistle players, I saw some of them use a different anchor, anchor finger, which I thought was interesting. And that was some of them were leaving this finger on. Now that's, that's weird, right? You think that's an odd finger to leave on when you're playing? Changes the pitch. But now a lot of old whistles and a lot of old Irish flutes, A is too sharp anyway, so it actually has a corrective aspect to it. So I saw that and I go, that's kind of odd. Why are they doing that? And when I started playing more tunes, I found myself doing that in certain passages. And then I found myself using this anchor finger in certain passages. And it dawned on me one day, that they actually, and I don't know if anybody ever uh, you know, came up with any theory or system, but it actually does sort of make sense. There actually is a weird logic or a weird system to it that I haven't heard anybody else articulate. <clears throat> and that is, if you think of a guitar and you have like a, a, you know, a D chord and a G chord and so forth, it's almost like there's chords to a whistle, like chord shapes. And so it dawned on me one day that having that finger down was kind of a, a, a G chord shape. And what does that mean? It, it, that's not making any sense, right? Well, think about it. You're playing D, 
playing G, playing B, now you're at D again. All those notes that are all members of a G chord, G, D, E, can all be played leaving those two fingers anchored on the whistle. So instead of moving lots of fingers, to do that, you're only moving two units. So these two are on. This is one unit. These always move together. These are another unit. These always move together. So by moving only two different units, you can play a, a GDE, a G arpeggio. And so that was interesting. And then now what's this one? Okay, it dawned on me one day that this sort of is a G as a D chord shape. Because if you leave this one on and you leave these two on, so this is your shape. You have one unit here, and you have another unit here, and you have Once again, you're only using moving two units to get an arpeggio. And I thought, how interesting that is. And where it crops up, it's not like the people are have like this in a theory. It's a byproduct of tunes. So let's say there's a tune. Um, okay, let's take this reel called uh, Sally Gardens, where it starts. There, these two are staying on. I'm just moving these two units. So I'm only moving two factors, two things, to play that whole passage. Now I had to take that one off. How interesting. Now let's take another passage. What about this shape? This I'm calling this the D shape. There's a lot of tunes that that involve a lot of passages and tunes that involve that. And just one that comes up uh, to mind is there's a reel called The Mountain Road. Now let's say if we're playing the theoretical bone uh, open fingering, you're going to start Mountain Road. What's happening is this finger, I'm having to lift this off all the time. Why? Why lift that off? It's, it, just leave it on there. And so what you're looking at is, uh, I think, economy of motion. Uh, is, is it, it helps, I think some players, it helps them play fast. This exists in, on the clarinet too, these so-called false fingerings. I think it's, it's you, leaving fingers on the instrument when it helps you play a, pass, a fast, complicated passage cleaner. Now there's other examples of that, and that is, um, like say, leaving these two fingers, let's see, um, can't think of a passage now that I'm thinking about. Ah, here we go. So, um, let's say we're going to go. So you'll see old player, old school players leave those two fingers on for that passage. interesting thing on that. You'll see sometimes players do uh, pats with two fingers. So he was playing that passage instead of going he was 
just going, leaving those on and patting with both fingers. cool effect that was. Another thing that, and that brings up, uh, there's these kind of percussive effects that you can get. Because if you notice this, um, my so-called G shape, and my so-called D shape, both of them have middle D closed. Which Pretty much sounds the same. What it does change is the effect, especially in flute and low whistle. So let's say uh, you have a um, the the cash jig, right? So um, that's a lot of work, right? Because you keep on taking this finger off all the time. Why? Why do that? Leave, leave, leave that finger on. I think it Im improves the tune using the closed D's because they're a little bit a little bit more percussive. <clears throat> so I think, let me know in, in the comments if you have any questions about this stuff, because I, I guess it sounds pretty erratical, but it's just observing what I've seen players do and, and kind of, you know, putting two and two together and saying, you know, I think that there's an underlying, even though I don't think that people are aware of it, I think there's an underlying uh, sort of uh, sense uh, or a uh, system or logic to what they're doing.